Hello, welcome to this uh, week's lesson on the One Year Bible. We are going to be looking at a transition in the Old Testament between uh, 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. We're also going to be looking at uh, John and Acts. And we're also going to be getting into some Psalms and some Proverbs. As always, the message for this year is going to be the unity and um, encouragement in our walk with uh, one another and with the Lord. So we will uh, go ahead and get started in a word of prayer, and then we'll go ahead and uh, jump into this week's lesson. Uh, Lord, we just uh, thank you for this opportunity to come before you. We ask you to bless today's lesson. Let it be encouraging and strengthen everybody's hearts. And in your name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for showing up, and uh, we look forward to uh, jumping into this. Okay, welcome back. We are into the one-year Bible study. This is uh, lesson number 23. And you can find this uh, online at uh, oneyearbible.com. Uh, you can uh, go along with it online, or if you haven't already, you can also order the book as well. We're going to be going through uh, 2 Samuel and 1 Kings. The uh, purpose statement is to unify and encourage us in our walk with the Lord and with one another. And the historical overview. So the notes that I have are uh, David's grief over the death of his rebellious son causes rebuke from Joab as our readings open this week. If the Bible reviews that David is a man after God's own heart, we can begin to comprehend David's grief. David's orders not to kill Absalom were ignored. Absalom's death puts a dramatic end to any chance whatsoever of David hearing repentant words from his lips. David's agony reminds us of God's own heart, a heart that grieves each time someone walks away from him in pursuit of any other God. Another incident involving David we might want to look at occurs later in our reading in chapter 24. The Bible points out that David conducts a census. The census occurs because God allows Satan to tempt him. Afterward, God lays the burden of this sin on David. We may not know the heart of God nor comprehend his ways, but what we see here is that David was falsely misled to put his trust in valiant men who drew the sword instead of God. No doubt you can describe a time when you succumb to Satan's wiles, do notice how David responded when he realized that he what he has done. He repented in 2 Samuel 24, 10. Truly David was a man after God's own heart. So let's look at 2 Samuel 24, 10. Uh, and David's heart smote him after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity in thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. So, again, we see that David's not a perfect man, and we see this happen in multiple incidents. We see this with Bathsheba, where Nathan confronted him and he repented for that sin as well. Um, but what we do see is that when he is identified with sin or when he understands that there is a sin there, that he um, goes into repentance and he immediately wants to be um, justified and righteous before God. He wants to be holy and set apart. He wants to be clean and um, knows the consequence of these actions of this separation. So as we start to kind of develop this image of David and not only David but kind of you know the heart that he has which is this um, absolute trust in God and putting God first and how disappointed he can be in himself when he misses that mark um, I think that, that you know these are some of the characters of David that, that we would look at and show uh, why God would say that he is a man after his own heart it's not that he was perfect but it's that he realized his mistakes and when he did realize his mistakes he definitely went out of his way to correct them so um, we see in 
multiple incidents where he, this is just truly the heart of David, where he, he just does have a repentant heart. And again, his primary issue with Absalom is that um, lack of ability for Absalom to repent and to turn from his sin and return to God. So um, very interesting piece as we start looking at that and again points, pointing out to the character of God. Um, the author of First Kings in it, uh, the author of First Kings uh, in known but uh, is known but to God. The narrative here begins with the last days of King David and explores how Solomon, David's son by Bathsheba, becomes a king in place. Of note, we begin our study of First Kings as Solomon riding on the back of the king's donkey, or as some translated it, mule. Such writings in the mark of royalty, a servant king arrives. Certainly, we can make a direct correlation between Solomon's arrival and that, he, and that of his greatest descent, uh, descendant, Jesus Christ, who entered Jerusalem on the back of a donkey Palm Sunday. And yes, I think that with that is all, uh, we can definitely see that um, shadowing is one of the things that we would like to say or, you know, foretellings, these different incidents where um, Jesus was making some statements about his royalty and how we're reflecting back onto those in, you know, prophetic word and not only in prophetic word, but also, you know, where some of those foundational prophetic words are actually coming from. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's a great, great message. And we'll see that this gets built on later. Um, in Kings chapter uh, three, we read that God offers to Solomon to give him whatever he asked for. What would you have asked for? Do you think Solomon ever regretted his response? So, you know, this is one of those ones that's interesting because I'd like to actually just read exactly what Solomon actually asked for. The comment is that he asked for wisdom. This is kind of what he was given is wisdom. But what he asked for was uh, was was really interesting. So I just want to kind of just lay this out there real quick. So. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 9. Um, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this thy so great a people? So what Solomon's actually asking here is the ability to know what's right and wrong. So when he's making decisions, as he's making these leadership decisions in all areas here, it's just kind of a general kind of census. He's wanting to make sure that the decisions that he's making are right, that they are right before God. Um, so I, I think that what's beautiful about this is how God looks at that and says, okay, well, the best way for me to do this is to give you wisdom and discernment so that you can actually have the ability to better discern between what is right and what is wrong. And it's not too much later that we get into this concept of the two prostitutes that come with the um, child, bickering over the child. So, um, you know, it's interesting what he asked for there and what, how God actually took that and turned that into an answered prayer, which also too, I think, into its own piece is also something that is um, important to kind of keep in mind, you know, as we're praying certain things, you know, Solomon was looking for a very, you know, specific sort of response to something. And what God did to respond to that question was give him a bigger picture and how that was going to help him in a much bigger way. And as a result of wisdom, um, he was also given, uh, you know, armies and, um, uh, money and, uh, you know, all kinds of, you know, different things. He's created a lot of political alliances, he ended up with a bunch of concubines and a bunch of wives. I don't know if those are good things necessarily. And in fact, you know, we'll actually see that's contrary to the Torah is what the king's leaderships were supposed to do. But the interesting part of this, though, is that, you know, with this wisdom that he was given and with this discernment between, you know, what is right and what is wrong, from a worldly perspective, he made a lot of what we would consider to be the right decisions. But we end up seeing later that 
a lot of these decisions end up being um, the fracturing of the nations, the beginning fracturing of the nations. Namely, what's going to come into play here is going to be the high taxes. So he's going to pass this on down to his son. One of the biggest challenges that we're going to start to see is this is lack of um, leadership. Unfortunately, David did not lead Solomon in how to be a man after God's own heart. So. Um, Solomon was definitely given wisdom, but he was also too that we see the separation between Solomon and between David. You know, there's actually multiple times, like there's three times specifically where God references David and says specifically for David's sake, I won't do this to Israel. But as Solomon's building the temple and this whole process is being completed, we also start to see this fracturing pieces that start to come into play, that start to come um, massive issues. Um, slavery becomes an issue, um, high taxes become an issue, um, and later at a certain point this starts to begin the fracturing again of the nation of Israel in between the, the, the uh, two tribes of Judah and then Benjamin. So then we have Israel, which is the ten tribes, or which will later become known as the ten lost tribes, and then Benjamin and Judah. So, Anyway, the final part of this is how do you think Solomon ever regretted, or wait, uh, do you think Solomon ever regretted his response? Um, you know, it's, it's difficult to kind of get into the mind of Solomon. You know, I would think that, you know, ultimately, you know, Solomon, you know, also did the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. He also did Ecclesiastes. Um, so as you start, you know, kind of in Proverbs, as you start kind of looking at, at some of these books that he had put together, um, you know, it's interesting, you know, how he kind of gets to, you know, different perspectives on things. Um, you know, Solomon was interesting because he had the best of everything. He had art, he had comedy, he had music, he had everything that he could possibly desire, anything that could possibly be wisdom. He had, you know, literature from all over, you know, Middle Asia, Egypt, um, all of these things were assembled to help create the um, Psalms or excuse me, the Proverbs. So as you, you know, kind of start looking at, you know, what he had access to and everything that he had available to him, um, you know, it's really interesting that, uh, you know, what, what, what would you actually ask for? And I think that, you know, ultimately, um, after he had pursued everything um, to the fullest, I think that ultimately what Solomon would have asked for, um, which is what we should probably all ask for, is a, a deeper relationship with Christ. Um, you know, what we see in Solomon is that there was a huge lust after things, items, possession, protection. And this, um, I think at a certain degree, might have been a distraction for him. So, you know, on hindsight, um, had he pursued, let's say, for example, and this, these are all just hypothetical questions, but had he pursued, say, for example, his question was not necessarily to be able to judge thy people, but if his question had been more so, or his prayer had been so, um, Lord, I desire a deeper relationship with you, or the deepest relationship with you, um, how much different would the kingdom have looked? How much different would his relationships with women have looked? With his nation, with his people, with his sons. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that ultimately when it's all said and done, I, I think that we all kind of heard that cliche saying, which is, you know, nobody lies on their deathbed, you know, thinking, gosh, I wish I'd have just put in another 10 hours. You know, I, I wish I'd have just taken care of that last, you know, that, that last project. Um, you know, I think when we're in those, those final days and those final positions, um, I think that there's, you know, a very short list of the things that are on our, on our hearts, you know, family, friends, God. Um, so I, I would, I would think that, um, you know, ultimately that that would probably be his, uh, would have been a better choice for him. And I think that that would have led, um, 
to the same result. Um, but we will never know. So that's just the question for today. So if you guys have any thoughts on that, definitely put them together and uh, we'll discuss them in the next reading. So that's going to basically take us to the end of uh, our first uh, portion of the study, which is going to be the uh, Kings and Samuel transition there. So I appreciate you guys hanging in there and we will be uh, right back shortly with the uh, next piece of this. Okay, welcome back. We are going to jump into the second portion of this, which is the New Testament uh, section, and this is going to be running in between uh, John and uh, Acts as we do this uh, transitional piece in between these two. The appearance of the resurrected Jesus concludes John's gospel. In this final chapter, Jesus reinstates Peter. We are left to imagine how downtrodden Peter felt it to his reinstatement. Peter had always been the bold and impetuous disciple, but when he chickened out before God and uh, before the uh, cock crowed, his impetuous, uh, impetuousness melted into self-pity and disappointment. God's grace covers the pity and disappointment, and the next time we see Peter, he's delivering a powerful sermon on Pentecost. This volume is the second of two written by Luke. The first, of course, is the gospel that bears his name. Scholars believe that Acts was originally written in the early 60 AD. What you will see on its pages is the history of the early Christian church as the gospel is proclaimed in his Christ's name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Luke chapter 24 verse 47. It's a history we would do well to know because it's a history of how God works through sinful human beings to carry his message of salvation through belief in Jesus Christ. In Sunday uh, scripture readings, the story of Pentecost is often read with the story of Babel. How is it related? In today's world, how do we try to become like God? So in the story of Babel, we have this tower that gets built with the purpose of getting up to the Most High to be like God. So we have this uh, king that assembles all of the people, and, and as he assembles all of these people, they start building this massive tower, and as they start assembling this tower, God determines that all of these people building this tower to get up to be like him is obviously a bad thing. This is something that we've touched. This will be the third time that we touched on this. First, we see this with Satan, when Satan actually rebels against Christ or against God himself, and the great war takes place. What does he want to do? He wants to be like God. Satan, now on earth, what is the temptation that he gives to Adam and Eve so that they could be like God? As you start going through this, the next one that we see, this huge temptation, Babel, they could be like God. So as you go through and you start looking at all these different little pieces, you start to see that this is an ongoing um, challenge. You know, what's also interesting about this, too, that, that I often reflect on is the idea that Satan never thought that he could be anything more than God. His best attempt was that he could be like God, maybe possibly an equal to God, but he knew that he could never be more than God. And I think that that is always interesting because you never see anything where it's always they wanted to be more than God. There isn't anything more than God. He, he's it. He's that he's the top of the ladder. Um, and I always thought that that was an interesting concept. So anyway, so we start looking at this is basically starts to break down the story of the, ta the, Torah, the Tower of Babel. Now in this, God then fractures the language between the people, makes it um, impossible for them to be able to communicate. So if you can imagine a huge, massive building project and trying to see all of these people come together to assemble this massive building project, you would require a huge amount of communication from everything, everybody working pulleys and cranes and cutting and block and transport and food and everything that goes along with that. And to fracture the language like that meant that that project was dead in the water. And that's exactly what happened. So the tower doesn't end up being completed. But what we see here is the first 
action of the Holy Spirit or God's Spirit or His presence coming into play. And what we see this happen is when these languages are completely broken apart. So we actually see one of the first times where the, the gift of tongues is actually used, and it's used in the Old Testament. So the next time that we see this is in Pentecost, where actually in the proclaiming of the Scripture and the proclaiming who Jesus Christ is and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we start to see all of these different people groups that are out there that are speaking different languages as a result of the Tower of Babel, presumably, we now see them all being able to cohesively understand everything that is being spoken and understand it under one language and under one tongue. So again, we see the Holy Spirit coming into action and putting itself into play again. Um, in today's world, how do we try to become like God? I would say that um, oftentimes in today's world, we try to become like God by putting our wants, needs, and desires above everybody else's. We also see where we tend to slide the scales of morality to determine what is right and what is wrong for ourselves. As long as it's good for us and it benefits us, if it hurts somebody else, oh well, as long as it's good for us and it benefits us, then it's okay, we can go ahead and do that because it's better for us. And we see this kind of happening all the way across the board from celebrities you know, trying to buy off um, student programs for their children. We see this in, you know, corrupt administration. We see this in lobbyists. We see this in all of these different areas all over the places. As long as it's leaning a little bit more towards my side and it's good for me, then that's good. Um, th this is one of those areas, too, that um, it's so important that we you know, tend to, to have a hard moral calibrator, and that's where our scripture comes in. This is what definitely defines for us what the difference is between right and wrong. And some of these harder concepts like sexuality or marriage, um, you know, some of these other things that, you know, taking the life of another, um, all of these other things that we start looking at that are that we look at today in the world as areas for debate or discussion or moldable or pliable. When we go back to the scripture, there are very hard, hard lines for exactly what they mean, what their intentions are and what the repercussions are for them. So let's look at our next piece of this, which is in Acts uh, chapter 2, verse 38. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we get, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right, and the next piece of this is, let's see, Peter tells the crowd to repent and be baptized. Why do these two words always go together? Is this mandate for decision baptism? Um, you know, this kind of gets into some hairy waters here, so we're just going to kind of break down a couple of the, the concepts for this, you know, real basic um, in essence, the scripture tells us just if you're just a hard line, read it to repent and be baptized. So, yes, is there a decision that needs to be made in this? It, absolutely. Um, I think that the, we need to look at this from also different perspectives. If you're, say, an older gentleman, if you're an older person, if you're of a decision-making area, then absolutely a decision needs to be made. You can't just be sprinkled with water and told that you're baptized. So yes, a decision has to be made if you're of the age of, um, if you're the age or the mental capacity to make a decision, then the decision needs to be made. So um, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of a two-part piece to that. So the next piece of this is uh, why is it okay for um, baptism of infants when they cannot repent on their own? Um, this is also one of those things that can become a um, denominational issue. This can become a, um, a separation issue within the church. The Lutheran perspective on this is we baptize on their behalf that we're going to bring them up in the church that they will then be able to fulfill their baptism at a later date. And they will already they will just acknowledge their baptism. Um, through their teaching and through their actions and through um, their sanctification, through their walk. So um, it provides the opportunity for them to be baptized. The uh, you know, other side of that is we can look at you know, the Old Testament and we can see where David, for example, um, his child was never baptized. He lost his firstborn to Bathsheba and he, he was, his child was never baptized. And he said point blank that I will see him again in paradise. So we also can see these different areas that kind of sit into place and come into play there. 
Um, again, this is one of those situations that can be a uh, area where people can really take a hard stand and really start digging in and, and getting very argumentative. I think it's a great um, discussion. I think it's a, a wonderful topic to get into, which is going to force you to get into the word deeper and deeper, no matter which position you take on it, whether um, you need to be a full-blown adult in order to make that decision of baptism or infant baptism is perfectly acceptable, no matter which side of that scale that you, that you, that you fall into. It's a wonderful discussion to get into. Um, when we start to get into things that are salvational based, um, that's where we really start to really want to make some very, very, very hard stands. If they're old enough that you can get into the discussion with them about baptism, then convince them to get baptized. <laughs> if they're children and they haven't gotten baptized yet and their parents don't want to baptize them, the best that you can do is explain to them you know, what our position is in the scripture as it stands. But when it gets into some of these other areas like, um, you know, repentance for our sins, say by grace and grace alone, um, Jesus died for our sins, uh, he is the son of God, uh, death and resurrection. When we start to get into some of these pieces that are truly, um, you know, damnationable, then I think that those are the ones that, that we start making a little bit harder stand. And again, these are always things that are done with a gentle tongue and for the purpose of reconciliation, not for the purpose of making a point, not for the purpose of winning an argument, but the, for, for the purpose of reconciliating or reconciling that person with the Father and making sure that they understand um, what those decisions are, and hopefully changing from those decisions in general. Um, that will take us into uh, chapter four. Four, which is question number three, Peter tells the crowd that the miracle they have witnessed was done in the name of Christ. Why was it so important that Peter say these words? Why does the press today tend to dismiss those who give credit to God? Um, it was important to say these words because Peter needed to take a, um, again, take the focus off of himself, off the apostles, and start shifting that focus right back to Christ and to the person that they had just persecuted and crucified, showing that the messianic prophecy had actually been fulfilled, as was in uh, Psalm 72 and Psalm chapter 2 and 139, as we see in Isaiah, and as we saw in 2 Samuel 7 and Genesis chapter 12. The Messiah has actually come, and this was him, and he died and was resurrected and because of this we are now saved so we start to see this message that he is actually proclaiming and he's pointing right back to God so we see Peter um, reinstated as this rock again you know in front of the Sadducees and in front of the Pharisees and in front of the hard questions he's out there actually connecting some of these dots that they hadn't fully seen before so now he's showing them exactly what these things mean and how they come together to complete this entire story of who Jesus Christ is and how Jesus Christ is now this risen Messiah so as we go and we start looking at that, um, you know, that would be the core focus and, and where we start seeing, you know, Peter pointing to is again who Jesus is and why Jesus is who he is. Uh, why does the press of today tend to dismiss those who give credit to God? Well, you know, I think that um, oftentimes what it comes into is a couple of different pieces. Um, you know, one of those is the the idea of those who give uh, credit to God and start pointing to God, um, you know, it starts to question a lot of different concepts and a lot of different ideas. And I think that sometimes as Christians, we don't acknowledge the miracles and latch on to those miracles as well as we should. Um, you know, our book, our library is special because it is a book of miracles. These are things that were done through divine intervention. They are very special, they are very unique, and they have a very um, particular purpose and point when they're done. And when we start to see miracles in general, I think that each of these miracles that we see, not only do, do they have a purpose, but they also glorify and honor God. Um, so, you know, in the Old Testament, we see like the parting of the Red Seas, and this is something that we can definitely, um, scientists have, have determined that they can explain away through the proper wind conditions, the proper season, the proper lack of rain, um, can actually create a condition where there is a land mass or a canal there that actually you can pass over on the Red Sea. Well, 
it's not so much that that can be done, it's more so that it was done exactly in the timing that it needed to be done for that particular moment, that it allowed all of them to pass. Not only did that take place, but as soon as they passed, then all of these conditions instantly changed and then suddenly Pharaoh dies. Um, when we start seeing the same sort of thing happen with uh, Joshua and the parting of the Red Sea, we, we start to see this sick, or the, excuse me, the, the Jordan, the sandbanks in this of the Jordan River, it's a sick river that's in the, that's cut through the sand and it, the sandbanks break away and end up filling up that area and dams it off temporarily and it happens to this day. And when it does, it literally dams it up and you can walk right across that. But it's not the idea that you can explain it away. Again, it's more so the idea that it happened exactly when it needed to happen, exactly the way that it needed to happen. Um, all of these different things that we start looking at, you know, even in more current events, we start looking at, for example, the miracle on the Hudson and the idea that this plane was exactly over the place at where it needed to be with the proper wind conditions and that proper updrafts and the water was in the perfect condition and there wasn't any um, uh, boats and there wasn't any people in that area that could be damaged. All of these things coming together is what creates the miracles. So it's the timing for all of these pieces. It's not so much that that could happen, but it's more so the timing of all of these things coming into play. So I think that's a very interesting concept as you start kind of you know looking at it and start dissecting some of these pieces. Once you start having to acknowledge that there is a God and there is somebody that is in control. You know, in the book of Daniel, we see where it is referenced where I rule in the affairs of men or in Isaiah, where he says that I am the author of history. When you have to make that acknowledgement, you have to come to that place. And then when we get into a place where, um, you know, the press tends to dismiss those who give credit to God, what we start to see is if you have to give credit to God, if you have to focus on God, then that means that you have to start adjusting and understanding that there is an accountability, uh, there is a moral accountability that sits into place. No longer are you able to hold the scales of autonomy for yourselves and determine what is right and wrong. But now that is actually set in stone in the scripture and it tells us very clearly what is right and what is wrong and what is the appropriate response. And as we go through and we look at all of these different things and we look at these hard topics that are out, like we touched on before, like sexuality and marriage and, you know, killing of the innocents. As you start looking at all of these different hard concepts that people want to put up for debate, you can debate them as much as you choose to debate them. But the bottom line is, is there's there's lines that are clearly defined. And this is where our morality stands. And I think that when you start to... Um, detract from people that are focusing on God, pointing to God, showing God, showing God's grace, his mercy, his honest, his kindness, um, his, his just never-ending love. When you're, when you're doing all of these things, it's going to force you to then start reevaluating that re relationship and those concepts. And eventually, inevitably, we don't want to be accountable. Um, you know, the law is written on our heart. And the scripture tells us point blank that um, the mountains and the sun and the air and the, the wind and the sky, everything declares his majesty and his glory. So in essence, the scripture tells us that we are without excuse. There's no reason for us to proclaim that there is no God because it is evident in everything that we see and do. The law is written on our heart. We know what is right and wrong. We choose to bend that law according to what works best for us not according to what the scripture has calibrated us to. So as you start looking at, you know, some of these ideas and, you know, why do, you know, some men of faith, you know, get dismissed or Tim Tebow's or some of these other people out there that kind of step out and do things that are um, what we would look at or society would look at as out of the norm. What is, why are there consequences for those things? Well, there's consequences for those things because it forces people to have to then do a reevaluation and determine exactly where is your moral caliber standing and are the things that you're doing right or wrong? Are you righteous and holy? Are you right before God? Are you set apart? So 
those would be the uh, three questions that we're looking at in the uh, this week's lesson in lessons 23. If you hang in there, we will slip into our Psalms and our Proverbs, and then we will get into our closing question. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, and we will be back shortly. Okay, welcome back. We are heading into the final piece of the uh, lesson here. This is going to take us into Psalms and into Psalms. We're going to be, this week's reading was through 120 through 126. And we also had Proverbs 16, 16 through 27. So let's go ahead and take a look at the Psalms 121. Uh, which is, we are assured that God will not let our foot slip, yet we know that unfortunate things do happen to God's people. How do we reconcile this? So Psalms 120 is the one that we are actually going to be, actually Psalms 121 is the one that we'll be looking at. I will lift up my eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee day by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So the question was, um, unfortunate things do happen to God's people. How do we reconcile this? Well, you know, there's also a passage in here where it says the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. So good things do happen to bad people. Bad people do have good things happen to them. I mean, there's a whole book in Ecclesiastes which kind of breaks down this whole concept. You know, inevitably, you know, when we start looking at this the whole piece of how do we reconcile this, um, this actually kind of puts us into a different series, which is actually the, the wisdom series. And oftentimes with the wisdom series, I'll also include psalms which teaches us how to pray, and then Song of Solomon, which teaches us how to love, and then ultimately the core of the Wisdom Series, which is the most common theological accepted books, would be the three, which would be Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. So in Proverbs, we learn this concept of wisdom and understanding, and as you do good, then good things will happen to you. And this is kind of the core message as we look at Proverbs. But we must also keep in mind that Proverbs are not laws. Proverbs are predictions. So um, if you do do these things, then in general, yes, these things will happen to you. And if you do bad things, then in general, bad things will happen to you. But then we also see into the book of Ecclesiastes where that's not always the case, where the riches don't always go to the wise and the race doesn't always go to the athlete. So we see this other scenario that kind of starts to fall into place here. And what we start to understand is that there's more to the picture that we simply do not see. But even though we do not see what's going on in this picture, we still trust in God. We trust that God is a just and a righteous God. We get into the final piece of the wisdom series. We actually get into the book of Job. And in the book of Job, it starts to connect these dots a little bit better in between this wisdom and this concept of wisdom not always actually shaking out to be exactly what we're expecting it to be and why we do trust. And in the final passages of Job, we start to see the position where God actually does kind of explain himself in a sense. His position is pretty much I mean, where were you when I laid out the foundation of the, world, the earth and I determined its measurements? And where were you when I put the sun in the sky or when I gave the stars their names? And where were you when I determined the mating habits of the gazelles or the feeding habits of the lions? And he just goes through this series of things and the separation of the earth and the land and all of these different bits and pieces. And we start to get this bigger concept of God is in control of not only the small little things that are in our day-to-day -day life, but he's in control of things at a cosmic level. And he sees things that we simply just do not see. He understands things in a way that we do not 
understand. So inevitably we have trust in God because he is the creator. He is the author of history. He is the one that has the plan. He is um, the one that rules in the affairs of men. So uh, this is basically how we start to reconcile this, is that fully understanding that this is God's earth, this is his plan, and um, we are his children, and we acknowledge that we trust him with our entire heart, um, solely, uh, 100%. And even though trials and tribulations do come, we take those as blessings because those allow us to grow closer to the Father through those trials and tribulations. And when the blessings come, we take those as blessings as well because, again, they allow us to grow closer to the Father and offer honor and glory and thanks and appreciation for all of his kindness and mercy. So... You take all of these pieces together, and this is how we reconcile living in a broken world. Um, the next piece of this is into Proverbs, and Proverbs is in chapter 16, and this one is referencing pride uh, goeth before a fall is a commonly used adage from Proverbs. What others do you recall? Well, um, I can only think of a handful off the top of my head, so we whipped out handy-dandy Google, and we'll go ahead and press through a few of these, and I think some of these will hit home. Um, where is there no revelation? People cast off restraint, but blessed are those who heed wisdom and instruction. Uh, this is actually one of my favorites. It says, iron sharpens iron, so one, per so one person sharpens another. Um, for receiving instruction is prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. Um, let's see. Those who conceal their sins do not prosper, that those who confess renounce them and find mercy. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. Um, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. A gentle answer turneth away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. And let's see. Uh, here we go. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. So as you go through, I mean, there's a, a ton of these proverbs that, you know, come into play, these predictions, these kind of rules um, to live by. And those are a handful. I think that, you know, everybody's probably got one or two or maybe even more that they just kind of reference and think about, you know, commonly. Um, I think parents kind of reference the one, um, you know, raise your child up and he will not depart from it. You know, to, so there's. You know, different ones like that, or, you know, only a fool despises uh, correction. Um, you, know, a, you know, a loving father um, corrects his child. You know, those are all the ones that, you know, the parents, I think, like to whip out, you know, when they're, you know, in the heat of a, uh, you know, discussion with their children, <laughs> so to speak. All right. So the final um, piece of this that we have is, um, how might the Holy Spirit be work? Uh, be work. Uh, how might the Holy Spirit be at work in these readings to unify and encourage us in our walk with the Lord and in one another? So when we start looking back at Second Samuel, or excuse me, yeah, Second Samuel, and we also are looking at Kings. Um, the transition into there, we start to see, um, you know, corely the big unification there is where David has truly established Israel um, as a true nation at this point. And he's now handing off the reins into Solomon, who is going to be the next king that is going to take over the next piece. He's going to start building the temple. He's going to start unifying worship, getting everybody all into one central location. Um, so you know, there's a, a few different pieces in the Old Testament where we actually start to see this. And in the New Testament, what we start to see is this unification in between the Gentiles and the Jews, where we're starting to see now in Pentecost, where the Spirit has been released and it's starting to tie in and bring together the people um, of all nations, which is actually what was proclaimed in Jeremiah and Ezekiel as well. Um, in the Psalms reading, uh, we start to see this idea of uh, how do we reconcile living in a bad world 
And it's through trust, you know, through trust in God. And it's through that trust in God, um, you know, that we as a church come together and unify ourselves. You know, we are all one body. Um, you know, there's this common concept that, you know, I don't necessarily need to go to church. I have to go to church. You know, Paul kind of looked at it, you know, kind of like this, that um, we're all one body and we're all necessary. And uh, yes, you are part of the head of the church um, wherever you are sitting at, but to be part of the body, which is connected to the head, which is a bigger portion of this entire commitment that we're working into here. We The idea is for us to work together is in unity and in harmony with all ethnicities coming together, um, worshiping one God, using all of our different strengths and all of our different asset, uh, assets and, and uh, utilities and perspectives and all of these different things coming together all to glorify and honor God. So as we start looking at all of these different pieces, um, you know, these are some of the things that, that we start really tying into when it comes into this idea of, of, of reconciliation and, and bringing people all together. You know, ultimately, the whole ride that we're on here is in between reconciliation between us and our brothers and us and our father. And that's where all of our heart is always coming into. When it comes into correction in the church, it's always about reconciliation. In relationships, it's always about reconciliation. Us between the father Jesus, reconciliation, I and mean, it's all coming down into, into reconciliation for the sake of salvation, which in essence is the core message of the Bible. The Bible is all about is salvation. So the next piece of this is the uh, Proverbs and pride goeth before fall. Um, you know, one of the main things that we looked at in Second Samuel was this whole concept of, you know, how God exalts the humble but brings low the prideful and how much of a problem being prideful is to God. So, um, you know, as we start looking at that and we start looking at this concept of unity and encouraging each other, um, how important it is that we um, are humbled before our brothers and that we do realize our position of um, servitude and that our position is to put everybody else's wants, needs, and desires above our own. And as we take that position and we truly are genuinely trying to help people um, these are the things that start to bring in the unification. These are the things that start to bring in encouragement. Um, you know, there's a big difference in between, you know, flattery and in between um, encouragement. You know, flattery boasts, but encouragement grows. So, you know, we're, we're looking to unify and we're looking to encourage our brothers and to encourage them to grow and, and, and to encourage the church to come together stronger as one um, unified body. So these would be the, the things that we're looking for as we um, start you know, tying together this final piece and, and kind of you know, reconciling that last and final question in that. Uh, the final piece of this is uh, close your time in God's word with prayer, thanking him for all he has shown you this week. All right. Well, Lord, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come before you, Lord. We thank you for all the wonderful things that you've done this week, Father. We thank you for showing us the things in the hidden places, Father, and, and to bringing to light the things that we already knew about. Lord, we ask you to give us a heart like David, Father, to show us the things that we're not aware of, Father. Make them aware to us, Father. Help us to just have a, a more humble and a, and a more pleasing heart to you, Father, something that we can truly look at and put all of our hopes, wants, dreams, and desires into. Lord, help us to put you first in every single thing that we do, Lord. As we go out into this week, Lord, we ask you to give us eyes to see, Father, give us ears to hear, and give us a tongue that speaks only your word. Father, give us a heart that loves as you love. If there's anybody that we can be a blessing to, Father, then put them in our path. Lord, we love you with our whole heart, and we can't wait to see you. And in your precious name we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, church, that is going to end it for Lesson 23. I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me, and we will uh, be talking to you soon. Bye for now.